Hello, so I think we're going to get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Dorota Bichel and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in art history at the University of Houston School of Art. I am delighted uh, you have decided to join for, uh, for the third part in our series, Interrogating Global Contemporary Art, Research, Pedagogy, Museums. Welcome to those of you who have joined us before. Uh, many of you have joined us for talks with Mari Carmen and David Jocelyn. Thank you for returning for the third time. And many thanks to those of you who are tuning in for the first time. This series reflects the intellectual investments of our faculty and of our graduate students in our MA in Art History program, now proudly celebrating its 10th year. It complements the work of our students do in the classrooms, as well as the many paid internships and instructional assistantships that they hold that amplify their studies. Houston is currently the most diverse city in the United States. And as such, as we, my colleagues Sandra Zalman and Natalie Heron and I were conceiving this convening, we felt the particular urgency to, of addressing the global contemporary here in Houston uh, and here in Texas, in the borderlands. Thinking locally about the implications of the global, we are not here merely to celebrate the global contemporary paradigm, but to critically interrogate its emergence, its influence, and its implications for the future of our work as researchers, scholars, teachers, and curators. We wanted to ask, what is global contemporary art and how is it remaking approaches to artistic practice, scholarship and curation in a moment of cultural reckoning that has rendered past efforts at diversifying and expanding the canon insufficient? How can the idea of global contemporary art help us critically and ethically engage in the reinvention of a historically exclusive discipline? As academic programs and museums adopt its rhetoric, along with its weaknesses and blind spots, is global contemporary art here to stay? Back in 2019, in a pre-COVID era, we originally conceived these events as a one-day in-person intensive convening. And we were grateful at that time to receive support from the University of Houston Division of Research for our plans and to join up with UH's uh, Blaffer Art Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston as organizational partners. However, now circumstances allow us to have a go at the truly global conversation, at least to the extent that the time zones and the language allow us. Um, so we invite you to enter your questions in the chat window at any time during today's program. And after Leah Dickerman's remarks, we will go uh, get to as many of your questions as the time allows before we end at 4 p.m. Central Time. At that time, if you would like to ask your question verbally, you will be able to raise your hand and we will call on you and we will see, you will see a window inviting you to unmute yourself and speak. I will be monitoring the chat during our program today. And now without further ado, I'm going to pass our virtual microphone to my colleague, Sandra Zalman, who will introduce our esteemed speaker, Leah de Kerman. Thank you so much, Dorota. And thank you to everyone for being here. It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Leah Dickerman. Leah Dickerman is Director of Editorial and Content Strategy at the Museum of Modern Art where she develops and sets direction for MoMA's public platforms. In this role, she has launched the museum's new online publication, Magazine, being featured uh, right now in Natalie's window. And uh, before that, she was curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art, where she organized or co-organized a series of exhibitions offering new perspectives on the modern, including Robert Rauschenberg, Among Friends in 2017, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series and Other Visions of the Great Movement North, 
2015, Inventing Abstraction, uh, 1910 to 1925 in 2012, Diego Rivera Murals for the Museum of Modern Art in 2011, and Bauhaus Workshops for Modernity in 2009. Dickerman is also the director of the Mellon Marin Museum Research Consortium, a partnership between MoMA and graduate art history programs at Princeton, Yale, Columbia, the IFA, and the Graduate Center at CUNY. She has served on the editorial board of the journal October since 2000. In 2019, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Science. And I've been extremely interested in your scholarship um, ever since I saw the exhibition, the Dada exhibition that you did back in 2006 when I was working on my dissertation. And I was just struck by the way that you were able to recreate um, these sort of constellations and nodes of modernism that were both historically rich and theoretically complex, but still foregrounded the human relationships that made modernism the sort of messy and lived experience that it was. So I'm just thrilled to welcome you to the virtual University of Houston. Um, and Leah's talk today is entitled, How to Make History, Alfred Barr, Aaron Douglas, Hank Willis Thomas, and a few others too. So now I'm going to share my screen and pass the virtual microphone to Leah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the warm, warm welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm not in Houston, obviously, but I want to express my great appreciation um, for all of you at the university for how you've managed to turn the circumstances that we find ourselves into uh, an opportunity to have a more expansive conversation. And I'm really glad to be part of it and looking forward to the dialogue that we'll have together. To start, I wanted to uh, reference the op-ed that was shared with many of you and that appears on MoMA's magazine. And it considers a question that many of us have been grappling with in this summer of racial justice protests and the reckoning that that poses. And it's the question of what do we as art historians and museum professionals and all those who care about culture and culture institutions, what do we need to do? And what do museums in particular need to do? And a first response um, in many of the conversations that I've been part of um, and the demand letters that I've seen addressed questions of staffing, of board representation, of labor. Um, and these are questions that often fall under the heading of DEAI work, diversity and inclusion work. And in fact, that's right as a first answer um, because it signals the importance of shifting perspectives, shifting who's making decision, shifting the balance of power. But this is also the kind of work that many organizations from different sectors need to do, businesses, law firms, media enterprises, and not specific um, to museums as institution. And there's another important caveat, which is that because racism often exists outside of individual intentions and can be produced by legacy structures, that is produced in systems in which ideas of human difference and human value are made, um, the kinds of things that we often see in the skewed impacts of our justice systems or our legal systems and our educational systems. For real change to take place, we need transformation that's greater than individual institutions working in isolation, however urgent those efforts are. Um, and therefore, in our context, in the context of a co cultural community and a museum community, um, for those of us who work in museums and visit museums and care about art and artists, we need not just to reimagine what we can do within individual institutions, um, but we need to think about the museum as an institution, its core practices and assumptions, and we need to rethink art history too. Um, the way that it's taught, the narratives we create, the map of consideration, how we periodize, the boundaries that we create between disciplines. Um, all of these things are important in this moment in which we should be grappling um, with how to make a more equitable wor world. Um, and what I'd like to say that is to some extent before we redefine how we understand this in the contemporary moment and how we understand contemporary art, we have to redefine modernism. 
And of course, that's collective work. David Jocelyn picks up some of these themes in his book, Heritage and Debt. Um, and maybe if David's game, we can try to bring our thinking together in the panel discussion at the end. But it's one I want to dive into a bit today with three images for all, thought, um, each of which construct a historical narrative, each of which functions publicly, and each which is a characteristically modern form. The first, a diagram, the second, a monument, and the third, a mural. Um, so I'll take the next slide, which is one that I imagine is familiar to you as it's one of the most famous images in the history of modernism. And in fact, it's an image of the history of modernism. This is Alfred Barr's chart, the founder of the Museum of Modern Art, um, the founding director and chief curator for many years, and it appeared on the cover of his 1936 catalog, Cubism and Abstract Art, which was at the museum. Um, and this chart is the stuff of legend. It is said to craft our histories of modernism, our canon seen to reinforce the centrality of cubism and geometric abstraction to the history of modern art. And of course, it was intended as a cover for a show about cubism and abstract art. So that is in fact the frame in which it appeared, but it's also become a symbol of a certain kind of formal art history, one that ignores social and political and economic context. And so I wanna begin by saying that what Barr is doing is a good bit more complex than usually acknowledged. First of all, by saying what seems immediately apparent that it isn't all that easy to read. Um, for a teleology, it's not so linear. It's a bit convoluted with a lot of detours. Um, and it wasn't that easy for Barr to get there either. He made several variations of the diagram before he landed on the one that graced the cover. And I'll take the next slide. There's this one in which he seems to be pondering the relationship between several who might be seen as fathers of abstraction, Kandinsky, Mondrian, and, and Mondrian. And then I'll take the next one, or this one in which he's thinking through the relationship between cubism and the avant Russian avant-garde and the way that there's an abandonment of painting for construction, for photo montage, for typography and theatrical work. And now I'll take the next one, or this one in which he's trying to map vectors of an intersection between a decorative tendency and a structural tendency. So that's a lot of different full force fields that he's trying to pull together. In fact, it's prescient of the avenues of inquiry that many art historians have taken in decades to come. And now I'll take the next image. So when we come back to the chart as it was published, the second thing that's important to keep in mind is that Barr's chart was a historical intervention in a particular moment in time. New York in 1936, with Nazism in, in Europe and the, and the threat of war looming, and with America with its head in the sand. And for Barr in this moment, abstraction was something he saw as part of the recent past. He saw it as being on the wane. And you can see that in the charts. They cut out at 1925. The period between 1925 and 35 is unpopulated. Barr himself cost, called this an exercise in recent archaeology, tracing the short history of abstract painting. But this was 1936, and Barr was fully aware of the assault on modern art and artists from the first days of Nazism. In fact, or first days of the ascent of Hitler, he was there um, when Hitler took power in Germany um, on a sabbatical, a leave that he took for nervous exhaustion, which I think many of us would like right now. Um, and he tried unsuccessfully to publish on the ground reportage accounts of what was happening with German cultural policies. And this exhibition was part of his campaign to make US audiences more aware of what was happening in Europe, a rallying cry aimed at an un unconcerned American audience and I'll take the next slide. And this is the dedication of sorts that appeared in the introduction and it sets the project in relationship to the rise of fascism. Um, this essay and exhibition might well be dedicated to those painters of circles and squares and the architects who influenced them who have suffered at the hands of Philistines with political power. So the exhibition was a framework for salvaging art that was endangered in Germany transporting it to the US, 
and ultimately um, a framework for rescuing artists too. Many of the works ended up in the museum's collection. Many of the artists ended up in New York. And both of, both of these things probably impacted the story of modernism more than the chart itself. So using the chart as a form of history telling takes its cue from genealogy. And you can see this particularly in the earlier versions where um, it takes the form of uh, more conventional family trees. And of course, genealogy in Germany in this moment in time is politics. Um, and you can note in these earlier versions, you don't see the entrance of Negro art, Japanese prints, that appears later on. So when we get to the final version, and now I'll ask you for that. Oh, one more slide. So when we get to the final version, there's a kind of morphing that's going on um, from a more traditional genealogical chart to a diagram that is a mapping of forces or vectors. It's a kind of abstraction in and of itself. And on top, in red, there's an overlay of influences of Japanese art and Near Eastern art, African sculpture and industrial design, all things outside of the sphere of the European avant-garde. So the chart offers vectors of cultural mixing, hybridity or cosmopolitanism. And in the context of Germany in 1936, that's degeneracy, um, miscegenation. And that assertion in this moment of the cosmopolitan is an important emphasis in counterpoint to a politics of purity. And that said, of course, that doesn't mean that there's not an inscription of, the hi of hierarchy, there very much is. Um, Non-Western sources feed into the European uh, Eurocentric avant-garde in a unidirectional way. And there's no doubt what's posited as the main story here. But to keep this assertion of, of cosmopolitanism in mind, I think is important as well. Now I'm gonna to switch to the next chart which is one that I uh, took my hand at, reworking Barr's chart for our Inventing Abstraction show in 1912, 2012. <laughs> I wanted to do it from the first um, as part of a way of actually saying that the show itself was returning to the topic that Barr's show had taken on in 1936. And if his was genealogical, this one was relational. It was a chart for a Facebook age. So remember it was 2012. It's a spatialized view. Um, asking the question of how do ideas travel? How can you take such a paradigm shifting radical idea and how does it move? And to get there, our team asked ourselves the question of who knew whom. And we made this in a huge Excel spreadsheet um, with all of the artists that were in the show on the vertical and the horizontal axis, which you know, soon ended up a, a bigger research project than any of us envisioned. Um, and every time that we could document that an artist on our checklist knew another through memoirs or correspondence or photos, we connected those figures. And the result was revealing in certain ways. Revealing of the degree to which it didn't make sense to speak, to think, to study abstraction within national silos. That actors within the fields that we often hive off, the Russian avant-garde or American modernism weren't marginal but central to the uh, emergence of abstraction as a practice, and then it might make better sense to speak about the economy of ideas. And the chart also showed the way that certain figures became key nodal points. We marked those in red, connectors who did the social work of many. And so I'll take the next slide. One of those was Sonia Delaunay Turk, who corresponded with Kandinsky, shared quarters with Apollinaire in late 1912, which was a really critical time period, who corresponded with her cousin, who gave lectures back in Moscow with slides and copies of her transatlantic poem at the Stray Dog Cafe, and so actively working across borders. And she's not one of the figures who's usually highlighted in accounts of modernism. Um, but was a critical figure in moving ideas. And in fact, if we think about it, many of these connector figures, Tristan Zara, Guillaume Apollinaire, Francis Picabia, Vasily Kandinsky, happened to be editors of the little reviews that proliferated in the second decade of the 20th century. And you can imagine how this works. The editors are corresponding broadly, they're commissioning texts from writers, images from artists, money from patrons. And as they're doing this, they're becoming publicists and propagandists for abstraction. 
and creating links in a network and a network through which the idea of abstraction was championed and spread and helping to make the point that while abstraction didn't depict objects in a traditional sense, it was almost always accompanied by a profusion of words. So nonetheless, my chart didn't fundamentally shift the terrain, the map of modernism. And in fact, we didn't even try to deal with the interrelationship between Western and non-Western art. So another chart, this one, um, I'm going to, Sandra asked for the next slide, is a new diagram made by Hank Willis Thomas. Um, and you can download it at MoMA Magazine. And I encourage you to do that because when an artist offers you a work, you should always say thank you. Um, Thomas's chart is an effort to write the socioeconomic and the political into economies of culture. And what he did was he stretched the dates of the chart to 1870 and earlier, and then to 1970 later to encompass the period of European exploration and colonization of the Congo. And he uses color coding. So red pertains to Africa, green embraces European Eurocentric cultural movements and green suggests moments of connection. And the reason for certain linkages is sometimes more apparent in certain places than others. Um, and I'll take the next slide. So you can understand um, that European colonialism enabled the Belle Epoque, but um, might ask yourself the question of what did he have in mind when he made a link between conceptual art and the rumble in the jungle. And here I can only think that this literal battle for supremacy um, that captured the world's attention is used to cast a bit of shade on the hermeneutics of art historical movements. Um, all right, next image. Now I'm going to turn to another type of modern art history making. Um, and here I'm drawing on an essay that I wrote called Monumental Propaganda that appeared in the journal October in 2018. And given the anachronistic style of monuments like the one that I'm showing you, it's easy to think of them as something other than a modern formation. And this monument in particular is dedicated to Robert E. Lee. It's in Charlottesville, Virginia, in what was Lee Park. This is the site of the infamous Unite the Right rally in 2017, um, which itself claimed to be a protest of proposals to remove the monument in wake of the Charleston church shootings that happened in 2015. So there's two questions here. In, wh why, in what way is this monument modern and what kind of history is it? Um, and to begin to look at this, the monument um, was made in 1917, commissioned, um, the artist commission was Henry Schrady. When he died, an Italian American artist, Leo Lentilli took over. Um, and the date here is absolutely typical of most Confederate monuments. Most were erected in the second dec decade of the 20th century. In fact, the Southern Poverty Law Center has done an inventory and there are two great campaigns of monument building, Confederate monument building, one from 1900 to 1920. And then there's another campaign in the 1950s and 1960s. So across the states of the former Confederacy, and hundreds of these monuments still arranged, remain at least 700. And there's nothing comparable in quality that honors the winning side of the Civil War, the North, not even close. So we're not talking about an odd monument here or there, a one-off or a two-off, but it's a kind of mass proliferation that's not usually discussed in debates about monuments. And what this means is that these campaigns um, of monument building weren't put in place in the immediate post-war period by Confederate veterans, um, and nor did they appear in the 12 years of reconstruction, which saw great violence, but also great achievements, including the country's first civil rights law and the miraculous trio of the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, which banned slavery, extended due process, and granted universal suffrage, at least to men. Um, so these are the pillars of our modern understanding of citizenship. But rather, these monuments went up as part of the reconquest of the South after federal troops left with the consolidation of Jim Crow laws 
um, the troops left in 1877 and the Nile of black rights and humanity. And all of this was the spur to the great migration. So this points to the central paradox of Confederate monuments. Monuments, as we know, are usually erected to victors. That's a necessity because it's a question of who controls the territory and the resources, but the Confederate army lost the war. So for hundreds, thousands of these monuments to be built, the proliferation of statues across the South. Ooh, I just lost, ah, oh, dear. Hold on a second. Um, so for the proliferation of statues across the South, it marks an incredible, unprecedented federal concession of power. And I think that's important. It's a conscious political decision to pull back federal jurisdiction and leave the states of the former Confederacy to govern themselves, at least as far as their black populations were concerned. And an example of this is efforts to pass a federal anti-lynching legislation. There were more than 200 bills making lynching a federal crime that were introduced in the first half of the 20th century um, between 1914 and 1945, all failed. That was an active decision not to protect black citizens, but to leave um, enforcement of laws against um, terror and killing to the state. So the monument does mark a victory, but the victory that it marks is of federal withdrawal, the statuary manifestation of political advantage gained by the forces of Jim Crow. It's a campaign of reconquest, a territorial campaign. And in this sense, it's actually very analogous to the parallel use of monument in the same years by in the Soviet context. And these claims often worked at the local level as well. They would be cited within civic spaces at boundary lines, um, at the borders of black and immigrant communities to cordon off white spaces. And that's true in Charlottesville as well. Three UVA grad students have shown that in Charlottesville, the Lee Monument sat at the edge of Vinegar Hill, which was a thriving black community to define terrain within the city itself. So the first answer to the first question is, in what way is it modern? Is that it aimed at mass proliferation? Um, and the second question, and now Sandra, if you don't mind, I'll ask for the next slide, is what kind of history is it? And in this context, the image of the recent past, which was constructed a generation um, later from the actual civil war, coalesced in a figure of an individual who was seen as honorable. Lee is shown on horseback as le military leaders often have been, but here as a representation of a generalized nobility without violent display or aggressive demeanor. He's got his hat in his hand if he's returning home after a hard day. And the force was very much the focus of Lee mythology. Traveler was a name that was known by children. His bones, the horse's bones, were mounted and displayed in the chapel of the Washington and Lee um, University in Lexington, Virginia. Leo Lentilli, the artist, traveled there to measure the bones to make sure he got the height of Traveler's withers exactly right. So there's a holding strongly to certain details. And on the other hand, in a broader way, this depiction of Lee conforms to the assertion of a fictionalized Lee, one who, a man who was a brilliant strategist, a sterling Christian, who abhorred slavery. The first two may be debatable, but the second is contrary to the documented record. And this is the clue to the particularity of the representation. The image reflects a, a profoundly influential book by Edward Pollock called The Lost Cause, which claimed that in the wake of the defeat um, and the book was published in 1866. All that was left was the war of ideas. The key tenet of the lost cause was that the Civil War was not fought over slavery, despite the role that the commitment to that institution um, took, play, took in the Confederacy's founding, but rather it was a war over a way of life. And you can see that Lee plays this role here as a melancholy Southern gem gentleman, the avatar of a fundamentally benevolent vision of America. 
So um, the idea of America as innocent was something that W.E.B. Du Bois picks up in his book, a 1935 book about the reconstruction period. And in the last chapter of that book, which is called The Propaganda of History, he speaks about the lies agreed upon and by which he means the stories we tell about our nation as fundamentally innocent and principled, the way we edit out its brutality, its violence, and its dependence on ideas that contradict those ideals. So now I'm ready for the next slide. So in that sense, we can see what's being addressed in projects like these. And this is actually not the monument in Charlottesville, it's the monument in, Richard, in Richmond. And these two um, images uh, were made um, after the callous killings of George Floyd at the beginning of our summer of racial reckoning. And the focus was the Lee statue in Richmond, which was the first of all the monuments in the nation to be erected to Lee in 1890. It's the largest in that city's um, Monument Avenue. It's a six story state owned monument on a state owned island of land. And protesters projected an image of George Floyd's face on the pedestal of the monument and Breonna Taylor's face on the pedestal of a monument with the letters BLM for Black Lives Matter and the slogan, no justice, no peace. And that projected super imposition was carried widely over social media. In fact, that may have been its intended medium and in a very direct way contradicts the claims that are implicit in the lost cause of a benevolent America, overlaying an image of violence, of brutality, of disdain for human life on the pet pedestal. And in fact, it's interesting to think about the pedestal as the site of this intervention, because the pedestal is what's usually used to elevate one figure above others, to take someone from the realm of the ordinary to the ideal, but the pedestal is also a fundament, the foundation. And here the literal becomes metaphorical. Um, the assertion, it asserts that the disregard for black life is the foundation um, for white supremacy and that writes it back into this kind of monument. So, for our final example of modern history making. I'm going to turn to another project, and this is another visual construction of historical narrative. And this time we're looking at Aaron Douglas's four panel mural, Aspects of Negro Life, that hangs in the 35th Street Branch Library, the New York Public Library, which is now called the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And it offers a challenge to the imagery of the lost cause that we've just discussed. And I think also a challenge to how we speak about the modernist avant-garde. Um, and there's many things to say about this project and then we won't be able to address them all here, but it will be the subject of an essay that I've written and will appear in the next issue of the journal, October. The panels were made to celebrate the library's acquisition in 1926 of a Toro Schomburg's collection of documents related to black historical and cultural achievements. And it was in the collection was not just African-American in scope, but it related broadly to those um, people of African descent. Um, the support in order to make the acqu acquisition, the Carnegie Foundation supported the acquisition in order to keep the collection in Harlem rather than as would have been more typical having it integrated into the research collections at the main branch of the New York Public Library on 46, um, 42nd Street. And this project was a mural that was intended for public space. It was made possible by the Public Works of Art Project, which is the predecessor to the WPA, the Works Project Administration. And this kind of federal support for art in the US was unprecedented. In fact, it's still the largest public art project in this country. Um, and it was um, launched to blunt the human impact of a, the Great Depression by keeping artists employed. Commissions were for public buildings and artists were encouraged to represent an American scene that is an image of America itself. The big caveat is that only professional artists were accepted onto the WPA or the WPAP um, payroll and most black artists were therefore excluded um, as they were denied gallery or museum representation and excluded from jobs on art faculty that would have enabled them to complete um, to claim a professional status and Douglas was an exception here. 
So what did he do? What kind of image of America did he paint? And I'll take the next slide. So the mural series was four panel series that offered a trajectory of history, um, African-American history in four stages across two mass migrations. Panel one takes us from Africa into enslavement Two, I'll take the next slide. Um, through emancipation and reconstruction. I'll take the next slide into the modern Jim Crow period in three and four, then northward with the great migration. And the narrative that Douglas constructed was remarkable both in its historical sweep and as a story of America as seen through black eyes. And part of the radicality of Douglas's project is the claim that this history is American history. I'll take the next slide. So I'm going to look at two panels because we don't have time to look at all of them. But the first panel is the one that he called um, the Negro in an African setting. And this is, brings up a key question um, for any storyteller. The question is always where to begin. Um, and to begin the story of the USA in Africa was unusual. You might, might be heard in the stories of street historians and Garveyite stump speakers. In fact, Speaker's Corner was just across the street from the library on a diagonal um, where these panels were hung, but it was very unusual as a choice in fine art. And so in this rendering, Douglas foregrounds from the get-go, the centrality of forced migration and slavery as America's founding sin. But it also makes, and this is important too, a claim to a cultural heritage of, of art, music, and dance. And I'll take the next slide. That cultural heritage of African art is one that fed European modernism. But at the same time in doing that, modernists subordinated black culture to the idea of an authorless primitive and a primal unchanging past. And this is something that Douglas and critics in his mist were very aware of. And Douglas's circle, the philosopher, critic, Elaine Locke, argued that, and I'm going to take the next slide, argued that younger African Americans should embrace their African heritage, that despite the 300 years of separation, it served as fertile ground for a distinctly Black modernism. And here, Douglas is drawing directly on African sculptural forms that he had studied at the Barnes Collection. Alfred Barnes was one of the first in the United States to show African objects as art. Um, and he also developed a theory of formal connoisseurship. And the silhouettes in profile also recall Egyptian art. You can see too that he uses these radiating circles of light. They're almost like Hollywood spotlights that suggest a sensory extension of sound or light that carries beyond the panel itself across time and place. So one thing that this panel does is claim cultural history. It's an assertion of authorship. Now I'm going to take the next image. This is the panel number two from slavery through reconstruction. And here the second panel acknowledges the Civil War. But as you can tell, troops are only seen in faint silhouettes to the right behind the four figures seen in the foreground. They're standing proudly and to the left again behind the figures seen in the foreground. They're in recession. And for the troops in recession, it's not clear if it's the withdrawal of Confederate troops or in 1865 or the withdrawal of federal troops in 1877. And instead, what we see in the foreground are spiky cotton plants with their fluffy buds, the global commodity that Sven Beckard has recently described as defining American's destiny, spurring its rise onto the global stage shaping its political and economic structures and providing the rationale for enslavement of African workers and the cause for civil war. In fact, all of this seems implicit in the historical panorama that Douglas lays out for us among the cotton plantings. And so if we look to the right of the panel, we see a federal soldier reading Emancipation Proclamation. The document itself admits an aura of light and to his side, a little bit further to the right sounds a bugle player whose brass instrument foreshadows the birth of jazz. There's a singer by his side offering, one imagines, a song of thanks or prayer. Um, <clears throat> and while a group rejoices with their arms above their head, one figure slightly to the 
left of the proclamation reader raises his fist. And at the very center, there's a speaker on a soapbox podium holding a rolled scroll tightly in his hand. Perhaps it's the Emancipation Proclamation, perhaps it's the Constitution itself. And then on to his left, workers in a cotton field rise up as they take in the words of this black orator or candidate. And then above in the upper left and still under the cover of darkness are a trio of on horseback of cone-headed Klansmen, the paramilitary forces of the former Confederacy and barely visible, a lone figure seems to turn to challenge one of them. So I'll take the next image. In this representation, Aaron Douglas is hewing closely to the book that W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about Reconstruction, his own project of historical retelling. Um, the book itself would be published the following year. Um, and when Du Bois wrote his book, he, he announced in his preface, I'm going to tell this story as though Negroes were ordinary human beings, realizing that this attitude will from the very first seriously curtail my audience. In the book, Du Bois trace achievements um, of the Reconstruction period, including the growth of a large Black leadership class, as well as the efforts at reconquest backed by violence. And read, reading Douglas's panel against Du Bois's text, the panel really gives image to what Du Bois has described. The orator in the Black candidate is at the very center. And keep in mind, this is a candidate, a politician, a Black political figure, that could hardly be imagined in 1930s America when the panel was painted north or south. The figure looks monumental. Um, he may be even be taking his clue from Soviet statues dedicated to Lenin um, at the moment. And it's a monument to black agency, to suffrage, to political power. So on the right, you have the joy of emancipation, but here this detail's focusing on the left and you see the betrayal of federal abandonment with the departure of federal troops and imagine this now hanging at the 135th Street Library, which suggests the latent legacy of this moment as thousands move northward to claim their rights as citizens. So I'm going to take the last image. So as I was saying, Du Bois's book about Reconstruction, which is an incredible book, and I would urge you all to read it, reflects again on what he calls the lies agreed upon the confrontation with history that white America has largely avoided. Um, and he speaks about how this myth is tightly held, that it's undoing meets resistance. And Du Bois's words point to one facet of what strikes me as so extraordinary about Douglas's work. It's insistent in its refusal of these myths. He addresses the complexities of the nation that most did not want to hear or see so that he can picture at the same time practices that contradict its principles, holding them side by side. So you can have law and racial terror, civil rights and segregation, suffrage and disenfranchisement. And this imaging of America makes visible the country's own fault line, the discrepancy between creed and practice. So I've taken you through three different um, historical constructions and I'm eager to talk about with them with you. Um, so we can move on to that part of the conversation. There's a thank you slide next. Thank you, Leah. That was wonderful. Um, I would love to get the conversation started. Sure. And I, I really appreciated how you sort of took us through these different moments of modernism and are showing us how modernism was really already dealing with the questions of, you know, these questions of the global. Um, and I was interested also in thinking about the deep engagement that modernism had with, I think, you know, with, with trans, uh, transatlantic conversations. Um, so I think what you're showing is that, you know, early 20th century, um, artists were engaged in international conversations and we just called it perhaps by a different name. We didn't call it global, we called it perhaps transatlantic. Uh, 
Um, and I was wondering if you could, if we can think of um, the global contemporary as an extension of these conversations that sort of began in the modern period um, and what you might say to that, like connecting sort of modernism in this complex um, kind of field that you've demonstrated that mm -hmm. it was, that it's not just formal and it's not just stylistic, but actually it has this very rich history that was always engaged with um, more than just kind of a narrow idea of like Euro-American um, aesthetics. Um, and if you could kind of use the modern moment to offer some tools for how to approach the global contemporary now, that was a mouthful. <laughs> I'm going to think my way, I'm going to talk my way into this um, because it is a big question. And I suppose what's been interesting for me is to take writers who that I imagine who really thought about issues like the Black Atlantic. Um, and I'm thinking about Paul Gilroy here, but Brent Hay Ed Edwards as well. Um, and really said, you know, how do we understand um, the history, the lineage of an idea like diaspora. Um, what does it mean when you talk about a sort of new model that sort of moves across boundaries um, as in, in, in time? Um, what can we talk about links, conversational links, and how did, how did people understand it in the modern moment? And so one of the things that I think is interesting is you see in the bar image that he's taking an anti-fascist position um, he is constructing an image of cosmopolitanism, of degeneracy, um, you know, as a positive. Um, and he's, he's using it politically that way. What Douglas is doing is he's being, he's very much in a conversation, even that's constructing an idea of diaspora. Um, at, at the moment, I think, in which a lot of intellectuals in the United States, Black intellectuals, are beginning to think through that idea. Um, the word itself, diaspora, wasn't used by Black scholars or Black uh, writers and critics until the 50s or 60s. That's when you see it come into scholarship. But what you do see around a group of writers and thinkers around Elaine Locke is that they begin to thought, think about an idea of heritage that's not just about the dispersal of populations, and it's not just about political cooperation across countries, but it's really about a cultural theory that links different players um, who have some sort of element of heritage in common. And they're beginning to work that idea out in a very um, radical way. And Douglas is coming out of that. So the idea of how you can imagine heritage as not something that's static and unchanging, but something that's a dynamic sort of borderless conversation um, is really coming out of that moment. And there's a lot more work to be done, but I think in this case, I've almost found the thinking that's emerged by people like Gilroy helpful in casting a lens back um, on the modern um, rather than the other way around, which is the way it sometimes goes for me. Um, anyway, that's, that's my short answer to that question. I do think it gives us a messier understanding of what the modern might be. And it's made me wonder out loud about the question and I'm trying to find my way into this. What if we say that in fact, given the centrality of migration um, to the 20th century, that there are waves of migration, what would happen if we put a concept of diaspora at the very heart of our understanding of modernism? How does that inflect the way that we talk about modernism, because there are many stories that we tell as modernists that are about expatriation or um, travel, individual transatlantic links, but what's different if you try to think about this is mass migration. Um, and mass migration is different because there's usually an element of coercion or trauma um, that's related in. It's less necessarily about one person's experience, but it, it defines things in a different way, often cross-generationally. Um, how can we understand these sort of huge demographic upheavals? And, um, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know that I have answers yet, but I think that there's interesting ways that it might inflect 
some of the most um, iconic paintings or works of art in the history of modernism. And I'm thinking now even of something like um, Piet Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie, where you can understand that as the intersection of two vectors of migration, of Piet Mondrian from Europe traumatized by war and of Boogie Woogie, the, the song form, the coming south from the south to the north and how that coalesces um, in New York in a certain moment in time. Um, and of course the great migration is the biggest demographic event in the United States. So one of the questions that I have in my head is you know, how, what happens if we put that at the center of what we understand as American modern culture? Absolutely, I think that's so interesting and also can offer tools for how modernism, you know, in recurating modernism and repositioning modernism, we can retell a story of contemporary and how modernism kind of shifts into contemporary. Um, we have a question now from my colleague, Roberto Tejada. Um, Roberto, do you wanna um, go ahead and ask your question? Thank you, yes, uh, I really appreciated your presentation and I particularly was captivated by this idea of putting a diagram, um, monument and mural together and I couldn't help but think of Alfred Barr's torpedo diagram later on <laughs> and thinking of our current president's <laughs> wall between the United States and Mexico as a kind of monument to his ideology. And then I wonder about walls between departments at an institution and what you might think about in, along these lines of migration and mass migration and diaspora, how to make history within an institution when sometimes even the categories between American and US American and Latin American are sometimes highly um, defined. I, I, I ran into that actually when we were working on the show of Diego Rivera's murals for the Museum of Modern Art where Rivera was in some ways reserved um, by people who worked on Mexican art and he was seen by other people as kind of a folklorist almost like a folk figure. And I thought to myself, as we were talking about this, that that's absolutely, he was perhaps the most well-known artist of his generation. Uh, I think probably only Picasso um, was as well-known. And he moved be through, between three capitals with great ease, maybe even more, but between New York and Mexico um, and, and Moscow. And so how can we, you know, redraw these um, trajectories in a way that makes sense, but there is a kind of territorialism of departments. And I've seen other fields, I'm thinking about history departments that have done more to define a global art history. The book that I um, was speaking about that Sven Beckert wrote about cotton as a global commodity is a really interesting example of a global art history. Um, and I, I mean, global art history, global history. Um, in fact, Harvard in general, their global history program is super, super interesting. And I, and I think that we need to take some lessons um, from that kind of approach because art history in contrast is, is still, I mean, you know, there's plenty of examples of, 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 of thinkers who think differently and Paul Grillroy's Black Atlantic book is a, a great example of that. But I still think we're more bounded than other, other fields that we might look at. And the thing that um, really, really came to my mind in working on uh, the Jacob Lawrence show was the degree to which there are boundaries between departments in which art history is taught and black artists are studied. And that to me seems extraordinary that we're tolerant of that um, within a university structure. And it's often true that the faculty in an art history department and an African-American studies department don't know each other or the grad students might not, um, that there's different job markets, different journals, um, sometimes different galleries. Um, and, and that is a legacy structure that we need to actively 
work to overcome because it ends up having impact in in who we hire um, as museums are. Uh -oh. Let's see, I think we lost, did we lose Leah mid-thought? Hmm, sometimes this has happened to me once before and I was able to rejoin um, soon after. I don't know, Roberto, do you want to, I don't know if Leah had a chance to finish her thought, but I didn't know if perhaps you want to respond to her ideas. I didn't, yeah, I didn't have any, any sort of direction in mind, but I just did, it was interesting for me to hear from a perspective of the museum as to, especially I did have the Rivera show in mind, like how that, and, and I guess maybe I was thinking more towards the present insofar as I think MoMA is looking to kind of rewrite from the present backwards, right? And to what degree is it interested in, you know, a whole swath of the diaspora that has been producing um, work in the United States. And I see that uh, Cecilia Fajardo Gil has also asked something about uh, Latinx and, La and Chicano art um, in this context. And maybe she can ask that if, uh, if Leah returns. I hope we can get Leah back. Yeah, I was also thinking about this idea of integrating you know, multiple histories together. And that's really the only way we can kind of give the most complex history of what actually happened. Um, and to do that thoughtfully, I think in both our surveys that we teach as well as in a museum context is kind of the path forward. Dorota. Yes, I, I, I am just heartbroken that Leah is not here with us. I have no idea what happened, but I think because I think that this is such a rich springboard for the conversation and maybe uh, uh, piggybacking on the Cecilia Fajardo Hill question that you can all see in the chat box. I just think you can, you know, can you talk about history of the United States without thinking the settler colonial project and more broadly and thinking about coloniality as the flip side of modernity, right? And it doesn't start in 1619, it starts before 1492, right? It starts with the Portuguese exploration of, so quote unquote, exploration of the African coast, right? So can we even talk about those histories without taking that dialectical relationship in, into account? In that sense, I think actually like the so-called early modern history is doing a terrific job uh, taking stabs at that. <laughs> Nothing well, like that. little technological stress. <laughs> <laughs> well, your your answer was very rich because it, we were able to continue the conversation. <laughs> I'm back, but you'll have to catch me up with where you are. Um, we we lost you at mid thought. Um, it was a, at the at the moment we were talking. I think about integrating and the problems of integrating those the the, the departmental. Yeah, I, I I do think that. I also think that. In sometimes I, the departments that seem most progressive these days to me, and I'll use that word, are coming from different angles. I mean, global art history is one, but performance studies, um, that there are other disciplinary boundaries that we, that we should be looking at. But I do think, you know, breaking down that kind of um, separation, it's still true in many universities and in many museums too, that in order to study black history, or to study black artists, you have to actively make that decision to do that. It's not a default that that's integrated within um, a curriculum. One of the things I asked afterwards was to what degree is MoMA writing or making history from the present backwards, which seems to me there's one way of re rewriting or rethinking the past about to do with the, the wealth of artists from the Mexican and Latin American diaspora that are working in other parts geographical parts of the United States that are less close to New York? Well, that's an interesting question because of, of course, you know, this was something that Sandra was suggesting. The history of MoMA is more complex. And I think that it became more restricted and teleological in the Rubin moment. If you look back in the early history of the museum, there's actually great, really fascinating collecting 
of Latin American work that's going on really in, I would say, two campaigns of collecting. One, Mexican modernism in the 1930s, and I would even go as far to say that the museum has one of the richest, most extraordinary collections of Mexican modernist work. Um, not that that was shown in the Rubin period. Um, and then there was another campaign that was under Rene Darnancourt um, that is more, more um, Caribbean in focus, um, more Central American in focus, actually also quite extraordinary with large holdings of Haitian painting that haven't often um, seen our gallery walls. Um, and they are more and more. And that's one of the incredible things of shopping storage um, with sort of a new agenda in mind. Um, what is clear is that the moments in which Latin American work was collected in the Rubin period are very limited. Um, and we have some, you know, some interesting acquisitions that are made of Latin um, American artists working now, um, but it's not as strong a focus as it needs to be. Um, not as much, yeah, that's, that's the answer. The historical collections are really extraordinary and there have been some, um, there have been some really important acquisitions made, but it's always a question of changing collections is a question of, um, of moving resources, um, which, you know, is hard. It's not, not impossible, it's hard. It's hard to move them fast and quickly enough. The MoMA is a really particular institution because you have like the depth of those collections. And I think also because Barr in that early period was really interested in collecting broadly. And there's that famous quote of his that, you know, he said, it doesn't matter if we, you know, if we collect, if we collect 10 objects, but only one of them turns out to be important. I consider that a success. And I think now we can look back on that and think, well, all 10 of those objects are also still in the collection. And as we change our framework of modernism and thinking about the global contemporary, there's still the richness of those collections. And that- There uh, is, but I also think that that is an argument and this is a more controversial position for um, deaccessioning um, judiciously, but also robustly um, because Shifting collections means moving resources. Um, and the only way that you can do that, I think, you know, given the way that the market has worked and prices have changed over time, is actually by, you know, really thinking about what is important, what has impact now, what has resonance now, what can we let go of in, in that context. Um, so, you know, I've worked at museums where there's absolutely no um, deaccessioning. And I actually think that it produces a much um, more static, less dynamic collection. And accepting the dynamism of collecting and being willing um, to use historical judgment and being very open about the fact that it is an issue of, yeah. of judgment that will shift again, <laughs> um, I think is super important. And being willing to be wrong. I think that's what Bar, what I, I kind of take away from that is that there is a certain kind of well, of course, the laboratory model that not all experiments are successful, I guess. No, I mean, I, I think that that is exactly when you get in trouble, when you're afraid to be wrong. Yeah. Um, so it's a question about being nimble when you're wrong and being able to let go, which of course is always harder in practice than it is in yeah. theory, but... Um, and I noticed in the 2019 reinstallation, there were so many objects that had not to my knowledge been seen since the 1940s. Well, uh, that, that, I, that I think is what's really, was really extraordinary as um, a campaign for us was a lot of that work was done within our own closet. Um, and MoMA has had tiered collections. So there's the formal collection, but there's also the study collection and certain things would enter the study collection um, as a kind of B thing. I mean, it was supposed to be things that were, um, well, 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 in fact, I should say the function of the study collection wasn't necessarily articul articulately or uniformly defined. So you can find things um, in the study collection that um, there was a Vivara Stepanova painting that we promoted from the study collection. And you're, you know, you, when you look back, you're sure that it's gender that kept that in the sort of um, 
the minor category. So looking back again and again, um, sifting through, rethinking stories. I mean, research is important that way um, because you can ask new questions um, in a different way. Absolutely. I'm going to... Uh... I'm going to ask Dorota to take a question from our chat. Sure. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that if you would like to ask your question with your own voice, you may just raise your hand. And if not, I'm very happy to read out loud. OK, so we have a bunch of really fantastic questions. Thank you so much for this generative talk. The first question is from Leah Leibai. How much do you think that scholarship and curating methodologies have narrowed the focus in understanding sources for artists, even as those disciplines have enriched and expanded notions of the artworks themselves? I think that we all have habits of mind. Um, you know, we think about things in structures. We have dates that we return to, exhibitions that we see as pillars. Um, things that, that help us navigate the terrain. And I've been thinking a lot with colleagues, including David, about David Jocelyn, about how you can create structures that sort of assume um, a tabula rasa, <laughs> you know, where you're laying out the ground um, again. I think what's most generative for trying to do that is to put yourself in relationship to someone from another field or with someone from another perspective and try to say, okay, what, what are the markers that you use um, to, to navigate with? Um, how do they look in relationship to the ones that I use to navigate with? What are the points of connection? Can we ask ourselves those things anew? Um, so I do think that there's a kind of mixing that can help us force ourselves out of habits of date in a conversation that we were having within our, um, even our October editors board, Hal Foster asked, well, what if you think about 1967 instead of 1968? You know, what, what shifts, what emerges? And I, and I'm only saying that these slight, this, these slight shifts can force you into new positions and it might feel a little bit artificial but that whole act of trying to reposition yourself and reorienting yourself, I think is worthwhile. Absolutely. Um, we have a question also from Melissa Warwick. Are you? Um, she asked, with all of the white supremacist cries of you are erasing history by taking down Confederate monuments, it seems like the general public does not even consider them as art. And truthfully, they're hard to teach in our history classes because so many of them are so ugly or poorly constructed. How do the concepts of art and material culture and historic documentation intertwine with these? Should we even think of them as art? Well, I think the, the point that I was trying to make here is that we do in a funny way always hear conversations about these as if they're one monument. Um, you know, as if you're talking about one monument and that it's a great work of art and not think about it um, in a way that is a mass propaganda campaign that proliferated across the states of the former Confederacy that has much more akin to the monuments to Lenin in the Soviet context than it does with any one monument um, that you, you know, see erected in a small town center. So I think once you, shift that from the idea of a single monument to the, the mass proliferation campaign, I think it helps you reframe the conversation a little bit more because in fact, you know, as an image of, of Lee, it's fine, you know, it's well-made, <laughs> um, traditional materials, not an unempathetic rendering, but it's one that's very, very carefully constructed to create an image of benevolence um, and, 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 um, and, and to write back in how these monuments were laid upon the ground, that the victory that's being celebrated was really the withdrawal of federal troops, the withdrawal of the US, um, the sort of leaving um, the states of the former Confederacy to govern their black citizens 
on as they on their own. I think that can help shift the conversation um, because it isn't. It's about a campaign of visual propaganda. Um, but you know, no. For me, I mean, for me, I suppose what I think is there's no one history. So it's a question of what history is being preserved. And I don't know why it's not as striking to watchers, to observers of this conversation about monuments to say, wow, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of monuments to the losers, <laughs> yeah, you know, to those who lost the Civil War. What does that mean? You know, why, why did this happen? Um, Absolutely. The question of propaganda um, brings up a question uh, from Beth Murfish. Beth, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Are you here? Um, you have to ask her to unmute. Did you do that? <laughs> well, I'll read it out loud because I think it dovetails nicely with what you were just talking about. Um, Beth says, I'm particularly interested in the potential of your work to shift ideas around the insularity of modernism. It seems that there are often lines drawn between propaganda, persuasive art, political art, and high modern art. I'm wondering how we might reconsider our teaching of modern art if we recognize the drive and ability to create non-political art as indicative of white privilege rather than some kind of purity. Is there any way for decentering the high modern in this way? That's an interesting question. <laughs> I guess I, I guess my take is um, is that that purity has no interest to me. Um, you know, it's just that art has always been about the things that human are are interested in. You know, um, money, sex, politics, power. You know. And there was like a version of our history that was kind of, like again a myth another kind of myth yeah but then it's a performance it's still a political performance um so and as we know that it was you know created within a particular context that the moma played a role in and you know used on the world stage in a certain kind of way and that isn't that i don't think that there aren't um works that are aimed at at experiences that are not um, politics with a capital P. Um, I, I, I do. I, I think that art can move you in ways that are often, you know, beyond your ability to actually articulate things easily. And, and in fact, the judge show um, that's up now, you know, is, is just a sensorially beautiful installation. It's really extraordinary. Of course, there's a politics to the way Judd is working as well and what he's rejecting um, as well. So, you know, I, I don't, I, I just, I just, I guess I've never been interested in this, this, you know, I've never quite believed that it exists, so. Yeah, so maybe we just need to work to dismantle. I that. don't, I like, you can just ignore it. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, Dorota, do you wanna take a question from the chat? Sure, I have. To, I had to find un, uh, my unmute button. Yes, so I wanted to return to question by Cecilia Fajardo Hill that uh, Leah didn't have the chance to. We addressed this question, Roberto. Oh yeah, and then you have to share your answer so, first. Yes. So uh, uh, Cecilia asked, "Can we include into this notion of migration and diaspora at the center of modernism, Latinx art?" How do you view Latino and Chicano art that is so marginalized and excluded from any notion of American art, especially knowing that democratic, demographically speaking, Latinos are becoming the larger demographics, the largest demographic of the country? Why does Latinx art continue to be so obscured and absent from academia and art institutions? I, I mean, my my answer to that would be that that you know there have been so many. Um, migrations um, in the history of the 20th century, you know, starting um, with Armenians, you know, starting with the first pogroms, um, 
in, in the 20th century. So it's not really a question about saying that one, one migration is more valent than another, but really a question of saying, can we see modernism as constructed by these vectors of, of migration? And what does it mean if we start to think in those terms? Um, where, where do we get? And then of course, I would imagine that individual scholars will always choose you know, pathways that are of interest to them, but it's, it's something, can we, can, we, can we move beyond the models of expatriation, which assume individual will um, and aren't really writing in the violence or writing in the sort of mass quality of, of these, these movements as events? Um, and what does it mean when we do that? In terms of, in terms of Latinx, I, I don't have answers in, in a specific way, but in a general way, I do feel like part of what we need to do is, is rethink our own, the way we work as art historians, that, that we need, need to find a way to open um, sort of our communities of scholars um, so that there's more of a sharing and, and, and that same kind of exercise that we were talking about, about putting dates and perspectives on a table, you know, can we do more of that? And can we think about who the key actors are um, that might move between and across borders and, and time periods and, and how do you do that? Um, part of that is literally putting people in a room together. And sometimes I think we fail at that simplest of, of levels. Um, and I guess one thing that I might hope is that um, with all the sort of chaos and loss that this year has produced, that our ability to have conversations with each other virtually and sort of um, transverse geography um, might be um, amplified in this moment. Thank you. Um, Jay Meyer Supinska, do you want to ask your question? Hi there. Thanks so much. Um, um, this is going to follow a little bit on some of the questions that have been asked before. Um, uh, I wonder if you can reflect on how working at MoMA to rethink and rewrite histories of the modern around concepts of diaspora and migration, for example, relates to acknowledging and repairing histories of exclusion and separation that were, however, uh, differentiated over the museum's 90 year history, very real. Um, those, those exclusions were uh, more than negligent, they were active. That is, they actively deformed artist lives, uh, what it was possible to collect, and history itself, um, what it is possible to know from the perspective of the present. Um, and there's a way in which the act of proposing new histories sort of comes in some ways to stand in the place of um, uh, those, those uh, the very stark uh, histories of the modern. You know, um, I teach um, the early history of MoMA. Um, I've just been working on the Societe and Anim. Um, and, you know, going through the project of internationalism in that era is, I mean, the exclusions are stark. Um, and to simply propose a new model and then have it sort of exist in presentness in the absence of kind of, like, what do we do with the, the, the real uh, gaps in the past? They're more than just, you know, mistakes that we can correct. I don't, I agree. I am, and I don't think all the answers are, are visible yet, but what I do truly deeply believe in is being very public and very open about um, gaps and the, um, the losses. And there have been some efforts that I think are really important, um, like the book that um, Darby English and uh, Charlotte Barat um, have done as a history of the museum that's very frank um, in a telling of its um, history. I think that's important um, work. And I think understanding our own field better does help. Um, 
And there's an example of that that I'm thinking about that has to do with Aaron Douglas and, um, and Meyer Shapiro. So more likely um, than not, you know, anybody who studies modern art will know the name of Meyer Shapiro is one of the sort of great, great thinkers and figures in the field and someone who actively championed um, a socioeconomic uh, social perspective on art. But there's a moment in which Aaron Douglas working in 1935 goes to um, the first art Congress for artists. Um, it's part of a popular front um, call for artists to stand up against the fascists. And he is representing the Harlem Artists Guild, which is the only artist group that's part of the larger Congress that represents black artists. And he makes an unprecedented historical appearance on the field in which he's basically saying that um, other people um, shouldn't tell the black artist what he, it is a he that he uses, can or cannot represent. Um, and that, you know, the black artist is the first to recognize um, fascism on the street. Um, so he's clearly in this conversation responding to a set of assumptions that are coming from the, later, the larger Congress. And I don't know what all those assumptions are yet, but it's interesting to play out. And then um, a couple of weeks later, Meyer Shapiro publishes an article. Um, Tam, I'm forgetting the name of the journal. Marxist Art Popular Front Journal. You're gonna have to forgive me. Um, where he says some liberal Negroes <laughs> without naming any names. Um, and it's unclear if he's talking about Douglas or Elaine Locke, um, want to create a modernism that's, that's a specifically black modernism. And that's bad, he's saying. It's bad because once you start talking about a particular ethnic identity, and he's using these terms, you are setting yourself up um, for fascism. And so his own um, worries his own sense of insecurity in relationship to what's happening in Europe is, is coming out. But that's a dialogue, that's a moment of intersecting values of taking an anti-fascist position versus an anti-racist position. And I think we learn a lot if we plunge in to these moments and try to understand what has shaped our field. Because in many ways, the Meyer Shapiro perspective, which you know, I can understand to some degree, but is the one that has shaped what, what counts. Um, so how do we go back and, and rewrite that? Um, and and, and um, of course, Shapira had many, you know, extraordinarily influential students. Um, so how do we understand that kind of thing? But I also believe very much in the importance of marking and memorializing. And I don't quite know how we do it, but here I'm thinking about, you know, something that Brian Stevenson said, you know, in, in his um, desire to uh, found the lynching museum, that he talked about how important it was for him as an experience to go to Germany and to realize that, you know, there was a whole process for marking and memorializing the bad things, you know, acknowledging um, terrible events of terror. Um, and that there was even a process that was set up in Germany um, where to get one of the plaques that you can put in front of your house, you actually have to do some research and you have to apply for the plaque. So you have to invest yourself in the process in order to get a plaque um, to put in front of your house. And he was thinking about these processes and trying to develop the lynching museum, museum. And it's just extraordinary to me in contrast, how little we know about our own racial history. You know, how comfortable we are with silence, how comfortable we are with exactly what Du Bois is talking about and sort of like not disturbing the lies that are agreed upon and really buying into this vision of America as fundamentally um, benevolent and innocent. And it's not that I don't think you know, this is not a takedown of America, but, but if we can't acknowledge the ways in which much of history 
counters what we see as great principles and ideals, then um, we can't really hew to those ideals. So, so part of it is I actually think is, is just speaking openly, marking and memorializing, being willing to talk about the moments in which there's discrepancies between creed and practice. Um, and, and that's work that we as historians and museums can do. Thank you so much, Leah. It, that reminds me of um, what I see as kind of your driving methodology, that you're looking at kind of the networks of ideas that don't map onto the silos of our history. And <laughs> I don't know if, um, that I, I My sister tells me I'm always looking for a utopia that's not there. <laughs> that's the definition of utopia. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for being with us today. We've really enjoyed this conversation. I think it's given all of us so much to think about, especially our students. Um, so I just wanted to thank you from all of us at the University of Houston. And thank you to you all in the audience for being here and participating as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Have a good rest of your afternoon.